Okay, uh, this is week three, part two. This is an introduction to the vestibular system, and then we're gonna go over the cortex and a, a couple of other things. So just a, a nice little picture here. You've got the vestibular cochlear nerve, your cochlea, you've got your usricol and saccule, which these two are responsible for translational movements. So front to back, side to side is the utricle, and then up and down like an elevator is the saccule. And then the anterior canal, the posterior canal, and the horizontal canal. So why is the vestibular system important? When you adjust, you activate specific canals. Proper activation of the canals can affect paraspinal tone. And then the paraspinal tone is closely related to proper spinal biomechanics. And there's direct connections to the same side cerebellum from the vestibular system. So well, just from what I've seen in my office, if there's changes in the spine, you will see changes in proprioceptive input. You'll see changes in balance, coordination. So having a spine that's in line, I feel, is very important. Um, if you do have a patient with scoliosis, you'll typically see some changes. So, And again, that's just from what I've seen in my office, maybe you guys see differently, but... So there's two systems, like I said, the otolithic system, which is comprised of the utricle for horizontal movements, and then the saccule, which is vertical movements. And just to remember that the saccule uh, inside the vestibular apparatus, uh, sac, so kind of like lifting in up and down a heavy sac, that's the vertical movements. And then the semicircular canals are the angular movements. So the anterior is for the front right, front left, the posterior is back left, back right, and then horizontal is turning head right to left. So activation of those semicircular canals, how can you activate them? Uh, for horizontal, turn your head to the right. For I'm sorry, for right horizontal, turn your head to the right. For left horizontal, turn your head to the left. For the anterior, for right, you want to turn your head equally right and anterior. And then for the uh, left anterior, you wanna turn your head equally left and anterior. And then for posterior, you turn your head equally right and posterior. And left posterior, turn equally left and posterior. So here's some input to the uh, nervous system, uh, basically from your, your semicircular canals, your utricle and your saccule. So this is the brainstem and there's a lot of in integration to the uh, vestibular nuclei in the pons and part, the, part of the medulla in the brainstem. So activation of your lateral vestibulospinal tract, um, you're gonna get descending fibers to the cervical muscles and all this stuff is coordinated. So you could have patients who have chronic neck pain or chronic neck issues because they have a vestibular movement issue um, and, and if it's not addressed, that chronic pain may, may cause changes in tone to the cervical spinal cord and to, to the muscles there. So just something to remember. You don't have to remember any of this, but just something good to remember for the clinic. So here's the eyeballs, um, no activation of any canal, the eyes should be kind of sitting perfectly straight, hopefully, in the orbits. Uh, when you activate the right horizontal canal, what's gonna happen is the, the, when you activate right horizontal canal, your right medial rectus is gonna be activated here, and your left lateral rectus. So this is a patient that's looking at you. Your left horizontal canal, you're gonna be activating the left medial rectus and the right lateral rectus. The right anterior canal, so when you're activating your right anterior canal and you're looking straight ahead, your right eye is gonna be uh, activated by the superior rectus and your left will be activated by the inferior oblique. So right eye, left eye. And then the left anterior canal is the opposite. So the right inferior oblique and the left superior rectus. And then the posterior canals, so the right posterior canal, you'll have the right superior oblique muscle, because that's the down and in, and then the left inferior rectus, because that's down and out, and then the opposite for the left posterior canal. You're gonna have the right inferior rectus and the left superior oblique. <clears throat> so conditions you may see in your office, BPPV. I'm sure a lot of people have seen BPPV. It's the most common vestibular pathology. It can be very easy to treat if you know what to look for. Um, the theory is that otoconia become dislodged and misplaced into the canals. 
the posterior canals are very common just because of gravity and the way that they sit. So here's a little depiction of otoconia that get um, that become loose within the ampulla of the vestibular apparatus and the little otoconia, I call them little crystals or rocks, get dislodged and that's called a canalothiasis. So what the patient may experience is, is you know, nausea, vomiting, moving their head is, is horrible for them. They could have visual disturbances. And the goal with BPPV is to get these otoconia to travel back in to the um, ampulla and, and basically into the vestibular apparatus. So in assessment, uh, what you're going to do is what's called the Dix Hall Pike Maneuver. Uh, I added a link in here, so we could go ahead and click on it. And we'll, we'll exit the slideshow and play that for you guys. This is a short video demonstration of how to perform a Dix Hall Pike test for a patient you suspect of having benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. It's very easy to perform in a variety of healthcare settings. All it needs is an examination couch positioned so that you have space on both sides and at the head. The patient sits upright on the couch, 70 to 80 centimetres from the end. To start the test, the patient's head is turned at 45 degrees. This would be a treatment for right BPPV. The steps are a mirror image to test for left BPPV. The patient is then taken backwards so they are lying on the couch, shown here in two different views. It is very important at this point that the head is extended to 30 degrees below the horizontal and as such needs to be off the end of the couch. So basically, lay them back. This patient experienced a latency of about five seconds before their symptoms and nystagmus started, clearly shown here. And then you can see the jumpiness and the eye movement there. Um, basically, what you want to do is you can lay them back, test them, see how they're see how they're feeling. Even if you can't see nystagmus, you you could lay them in the right posterior canal position and ask them if they feel horrible. If they do, um, you would go, I typically go straight into what's called an Epley maneuver, um, and that's what this is. And we'll go ahead and show you guys the video. I know you guys probably know a lot of this, but I think it's at least a good refresher because sometimes I get a little backwards on these anyways. Got an ad coming up. A dog. We'll go ahead and skip that for... Normally, only with head movement does fluid within the inner ear also move, informing the brain that a head turn occurred. However, should a crystal called an otolith gets displaced into the posterior canal of the inner ear, the PPV dizziness occurs. Fluid movement occurs due to the crystal rather than head turns, causing the brain to think movement has occurred even though none has happened. The Epley maneuver is performed to treat this posterior canal BPPV by trying to get the loose crystal out of the canal. This maneuver is started by turning the head 45 degrees and the body laid back such that the head is extended about 20 to 30 degrees. If BPPV is present, eye twitching called nystagmus will occur. After 30 to 60 seconds, the head is turned 90 degrees to the opposite side and held for another 30 to 60 seconds. The head is then further rotated another 90 degrees, accomplished by having the patient turn onto their side, which is then held for another 30 to 60 seconds. At this point, the head should be turned 45 degrees from the horizontal. When performing this maneuver, another individual can help with these position changes. The maneuver is then completed by having the patient sit up. So what's going on with these position changes? Essentially, the head is moved in such a way to manipulate the crystal to fall towards the canal opening. With each position change, it takes about 30 to 60 seconds for the crystal to settle into the most dependent position in the canal. If turns are made before the crystal has a chance to settle, the crystal may fall back the wrong way and the maneuver will fail. It is also important that the head positions are angled correctly or else the crystal will not settle to the correct position in the canal and the maneuver will fail. Also, if the position changes are done too slowly, the crystal may not settle quickly enough from lack of momentum and the maneuver will also fail.
Once the crystal falls out of the canal, the dizziness should resolve if due to posterior canal BPPV. I don't know why everyone talks like a robot in these videos. <laughs> Hopefully I don't sound like too much of a robot. Um, so that's just that's one, one way to do a treatment for posterior canal <clears throat> lithiasis. And I usually stay in the position until the patient starts to feel normal. And again, if you don't have goggles to look for, typically a patient will be able to tell you very subjectively that they don't feel very good. So here's a patient that I had come in with vertigo. Uh, she was a 20 year old female. She presented to the clinic with neck pain. So again, this is another chiropractic patient that came in, um, but she, she participates in competitive horseback riding. She's also a digital software lady, did a ton of stuff a lot of work with that and started her own company, but she has experienced several falls. She had a couple of traumatic brain injuries. And then a few months ago, her face slammed into the back of her horse's head and it created really bad right-sided facial pain, as I imagine it would, and vertigo. So most of the days, her pain uh, in the neck and face was a 10 out of 10 and her dizziness was a 9 out of 10. She also reported that she had changes with memory, concentration, and motivation, which is tough for a 20-year-old who's starting her own company. So on the physical exam, we did the Dix Hall Pike maneuver, and uh, what I saw was, well, you don't need to know this, a geotropic torsional nystagmus in the right posterior canal position. She also had increase in dizziness and facial pain on the, when I put her in that position, and she had a right-sided body tremor, and then she had right cerebellar findings. So again, another right cerebellum, but she had a lot of changes in her vestibular system that hadn't been addressed. So this young lady had had these symptoms for quite a while as well. So we have something called the Neurocom in our office. So I tested her. It basically has six different condition-based tests to test for uh, vestibular imbalance disorders with different types of visual changes and uh, floor perturbations. And her composite score is a 64. Keep it simple. Red is bad. Green is good. She had too many, too many reds. So what did we do? We, we kept it simple. We did some right posterior canal um, epley maneuvers. And sometimes I will say this, the, doing one sometimes isn't enough for people. Sometimes it's all they need. Sometimes you have to do three or four until you get the otoconia back into the right place and you get good stimulation to the system and it's, it's met its threshold to where it needs to be to activate appropriately. We had her do some right cerebellar exercises, some vagus nerve exercises, which I'll talk about in the future, and then of course some chiropractic adjustments. And this is after five visits with us. Her her scores went up to an 88. Everything was just better. I mean, if you can imagine, if you've got chronic BPPV, your vision's going to be off. And like I said, the area that's responsible for integrating a lot of that has to do with pain. So her pain was off, but she reported dizziness as a zero out of 10. Her face and neck pain went down. She had, she's able to think better, right? No one thinks good when they're in pain. And also, you know, her balance improved. So pretty, pretty cool. Uh, that was a pretty cool case, uh, especially just from a vestibular standpoint. And again, some simple stuff, easy stuff to look for on the clinical exam and easy stuff to implement in the, uh, in, in the clinic as well. So some cranial nerves. <clears throat> I won't read all of these off to you. I'm sure you all have done your cranial nerves and know them all, but we've got you know one through 12 and uh, I'll go through some of my favorite, but what I may do with this chart uh, for the quiz and for the tests is just ask a couple of questions about maybe the origin or the termination, um, what they innervate, what you may see from a clinical standpoint stuff like that, but I'll make sure you guys know what questions I'll be asking. I like this image, this is straight from our book, um, but I, when I do neurological rehab in the office, I'm always trying to think about who's whose neighbor, if, that's, if that makes sense. Uh, for, for example, when you do a lot of pontine activation and you activate the vagus nerve, which is kind of sitting right around here, um, you get some stimulation to other areas of the of the brainstem. So if you've ever noticed, if you if you gag or if you gargle water heavily and you activate those posterior throat muscles, which is activating vagus nerve, some people may actually tear up. <clears throat> and that's because the facial nucleus, which is right up here, uh, sits pretty darn close in the ponds to where cranial nerve 10 is. So just some, some really cool stuff. I just wanted to show this image to you to, to remind you that not everything in your system is isolated. You're gonna get some 
cross reaction to other areas of the brain and the body when you're doing your exercises and it can be very positive in nature so just a good little reminder there so some of my favorites for the um, for, for cranial nerves I, I love the pons area uh, I, I like to tell everyone um, especially our patients I think that we're we're over overly sympathetic in our nervous system from a day-to-day -day basis the way the brain works is we should be having about 90% of our output in the parasympathetic tone. So about 10% of our day, we should be sympathetic. And what I tell people is think about, think about animals, like think about lions. We were, we were recently in San Francisco and at Pier 39, they have these sea lions that literally just lay all day and they're just lazy animals. Um, and they just hang out. But when it's time to eat, their sympathetic nervous system gets ramped up. You get a little bit of noradrenaline, epinephrine, norepinephrine, fight or flight response kicks in. You go hunt your food down, eat, and then you're lazy again. And the same thing for other animals across the board. Um, I don't know, besides like monkeys, I don't know too many working on computers and stuff like that all day. But what I feel like is I feel that we have a lack of pontine integration and stimulation. So this is my, my favorite area. So some of the cranial nerves that integrate uh, in the pons, and you can use these as stimulation in your clinic to activate the pons. Uh, cranial nerve five, you've got V1, which is your ophthalmic division, <clears throat> V2, which is your maxillary division, and V3, which is your mandibular division. And the way I activate this to get good pontine integration to wake up the pons and make that parasympathetic area a little bit more excited and, and work harder is I'll provide some sort of electrical stimulation or light touch stimulation to those areas because as you can see they all kind of fire down and then they, they sit right in that main the chief sensory nucleus that's in the pons. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a little cough. So that's cranial layer five. Cranial layer five and seven. Um, this is the corneal blink test. So what I do is I'll test corneal blink. Um, but basically I'll take like a cotton wisp or a face tissue and then I'll have the patient look up into the opposite side and I'll just, you know, gently stroke the outer portion of the eyeball to see if we can get activation of that area. And in a fatigued system, what you may see is you're stroking the, the eye, let's say the left eye, for instance, and they're just not getting, um, good stimulation or activation. There's no good blink response. What you can actually do is you can either stimulate cranial nerve five, like I said earlier, with some light touch on the face, or you can actually just do that as a therapy to stimulate and get more pontine integration. So pretty cool stuff uh, on, on, on this one as well. Cranial nerve uh, seven, this is facial nerve. So uh, a good reminder, just in the clinic, if you see uh, ipsilateral upper and lower face that is is looks paretic or there's some paralysis there, it's the actual facial nerve or nucleus that isn't working good because the cortex actually integrates both sides. So the cortex, will, the, if you see this right here preserved, the forehead preserved, and this, the lower portion of the face not preserved, that's usually a cortical issue on the contralateral side. But if both aren't working good, then it's usually the facial nerve. Just a fun tidbit there. So for this guy, <clears throat> which side of the face isn't working? Well, if we're at, if we're asking this gentleman here, well, besides his his gnarly nose ring here, or I guess he's got two. If we're asking him to wrinkle his forehead, um, we're not getting any wrinkling of the forehead on this side. You can see all the nice wrinkles there. That's actually good tone, right? He's got some good wrinklage there, but he doesn't have any here. So what I would say is he's got a left facial palsy, and it's usually left facial nerve or nucleus. Um, and it's not the contralateral cortex. This gentleman may have suffered from something called Bell's palsy. Cranial nerve seven and nine. So I activate, um, and again, this is for pontine activation, but I'll do facial nerve simulation. I will do uh, taste, uh, some, the, the glossopharyngeal nerve, cranial nerve nine, like some bitter taste on the back of the tongue. So we'll activate that just to get activation of the pons and also the medulla in the lower part of the brainstem. Cranial nerve nine and 10, um, this is your, your gag reflex. 
So testing it in the office to see if the pons is working good, what we'll do is we'll do a gag reflex and if it's not there, we'll have them work on gargling exercises. We'll, we'll, ha we'll actually send them home with tongue depressors and have them do gag and increase their gag response to increase pontine integration. One thing I didn't say is if you have patients that have a lot of anxiety or stress, activation of the pontine nuclei by doing some of these things like gargling or light touch to the face can actually help with some of those symptoms because if you think about it, anxiety, stress, it's all overactivation of the sympathetic nervous system. But if you can drive the parasympathetic pathways through functional exercises, your patients may find some really good results. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to skip that. So cranial nerve 10, um, in my clinic, I ask everyone how they poop. I think it's really important. Uh, gut function to me is brain function and vice versa. You can't have good motility if you don't have good brain integration. So we always listen for bowel sounds. We always ask about bowel movements and um, just make sure that, that they're having them and if they're chronically constipated or if they have issues with <clears throat> what's called SIBO or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, we know it's time to do some functional exercises uh, for those patients. Okay. So some functional areas of the cortex and vascular supply. This is the image I showed earlier on, on part one. <clears throat> but uh, just just some, some areas. I, lo I love this image. It's straight out of Google. But I think it's, it's just so cool. For anyone that doesn't even know the brain or wants to just know a little bit and not get crazy with it, you've got this list here that tells you all these different areas. I won't read it, but just a great, great image. And then you've got this one. I think it's kind of, it's his evil twin here. This is when the brain doesn't work good. And what I did is I just highlighted, um, uh, or what you can see is in each of the areas here, it tells you when that area isn't working as well as it should. So some things to look for on the clinical exam. What I might do on the test is, and here I'll ask you responsibilities of cortical areas. And then I'll ask you, I'll say something like, hey, the patient uh, describes some difficulty with identification of and verbalization about objects. Which area of the brain could that be? Frontal, parietal, occipital, or temporal? And the correct answer would be temporal. Um, F hal, so this is the homuncular patterns of the motor and sensory cortical areas. And what I tell uh, clinicians that I work with is, a good way to remember stimulation in different areas of the brain is you've got um, F hal. So the the legs here are more in. I'm sorry, they're more in the the middle part of the or medial part of the cortex. So that's <clears throat> foot and legs, and then working our way out. So sorry, I'm going backwards on you guys. Sorry about that. So face is the F of the F hal, and then you've got the hand here. Then you've got the arm, and then you've got the leg. So working from the outer portion of the cortex to the more inner portion of the cortex, you've got face, you've got arm, you've got the, um, I'm sorry, I keep, <laughs> sorry guys, face, hand, arm, leg. That's what F hell stands for. I'm not sure if I made that up or if I got it from someone. But uh, the reason this is important is because when we're stimulating different areas of the brain, um, we can use different areas of the body to stimulate it, right? So if we had a cortical lesion in the area that's responsible for uh, the sensation of the hand or the motor side of the hand, what we want to do is stimulate that area. And it'll make sense in a second when I show you, show you guys vascular supply. But anyways, real quick, F hal, face, hand, arm, leg. So just remember that. I'll make sense of it in a second for you, I promise. Okay, circle of Willis, everyone's favorite from their uh, anatomy classes in college. Just, you don't have to know any of this, just as a reminder to blood supply, right here is in your brainstem area. So these are the pontine arteries. They, it is basically you come up from <clears throat> the spinal cord into the brainstem, then you've got some cerebellar arteries, and then you've got all of your big arteries. So you've got your middle cerebral, the posterior cerebral here, and then your um, anterior cerebral up front. And we're going to cover a couple of those arteries. So the major branches, you've got anterior, the middle, and the posterior cerebral. So anterior is here in purple. The middle cerebral, which I've seen most of my stroke patients suffer a middle cerebral stroke here. And then posterior cerebral. So anterior cerebral artery. Uh, this guy, his, his awesome mohawk is representative of the... Uh, area that's responsible for being covered by the 
the area that the anterior cerebral artery is responsible for covering in the brain. Um, and these are just some things that you may see, uh, some things that the anterior cerebral artery are responsible for. So controlling of movement of the contralateral lower limb, right? Because the anterior cerebral artery is up towards the top, which is the L and F hal. Hopefully I didn't confuse you guys too much with that. Um, the sensory cortex, so it receives sensory input from the contralateral lower limb. I'm not going to read all these to you, but just some important things. If there's an issue with the anterior cerebral artery, functions in volition, motivation, planning, organization, <clears throat> and of complex behavior. So, you know, there is something called vascular dementia, and vascular dementia is typically an issue with not just the anterior cerebral artery, but other areas that um, are responsible for supplying blood to that anterior portion of the brain. So some dysfunction, I won't read all this to you, uh, but if you have a stroke patient and you're trying to do stroke rehab, it's really good to know the area of the brain that's involved, because if you don't, then you don't really know how to rehab it. So basically keep it simple. Left ACA, you're gonna see right-sided stuff, right ACA you're going to see left-sided stuff and you'll see a lot of leg stuff you'll see changes in the motor cortex you could see what's called a hemi neglect if there's a right ACA on the left side um, so just important things I won't ask too many questions on that here's a this is just another good image of um, the anterior cerebral artery and you've got a site of occlusion which has affected someone's leg, right? They also have a lot of other issues going on, some urinary incontinence, but don't want any occlusion of any artery, so no good. This is um, this is the middle cerebral artery, so he's got the hair coverage. He's got good, good blood supply to the hair in the middle cerebral artery. Um, your, your, your boy, Mr. Costanza from Seinfeld, but this is the one I mostly see in the clinic. And if it's on the left side, it's responsible 97% of the time for covering Broca's and Wernicke's areas. It covers a lot of the, um, the FHA portion of F hal, so the face, the um, hands, head, and the arms. <clears throat> and then, of course, sensation. And everyone's gonna, everything's gonna be contralateral to the side. So if you see it, left um, brain stuff, you'll see right body stuff and vice versa. The lenticulostriate arteries, these are just important because when you really learn neurology, the this area right here, the um, basic, your striatum, so where the basal ganglia live, those are important for movement and we are chiropractors, so we help people move. So one guy in particular, the, um, the lenticulostriate arteries and the middle cerebral artery, when those aren't working too good, you'll see changes in that area of the brain as well. Again, nothing that you really need to know. I just wanted to include this in here because I think it's important information. I'm not going to go too much in depth to this stuff. Uh, so posterior cerebral artery, what you may see is uh, some changes in, well, this is the guy with good hair growth back here because he has good blood supply. That's my joke. But you'll see occipital lobe. So I have a patient in right now who... It always amazes me, you know, I'm not, I never put down conventional medicine because I'm, I, you know, I've gone through a nurse practitioner program, but from a neuro rehab standpoint, I have a gentleman in who had a stroke over a year and a half ago and he didn't have any insurance, so he didn't get any rehab. And this guy, he's now become dyslexic uh, because he had a left uh, PCA stroke. He has a right homonymous hemianopsia, so he can't see the right visual side on right visual field on either side of his eyeball um, and what we're doing is we're doing neurological rehab to help because he can't read he can't drive he's a drummer he loves to drum and you know he's only been in the clinic for a few days but we're already seeing changes in his dyslexia right because neurophysiologically the brain can change itself if it gets the proper simulation anyways that's my soapbox we just have to do a better job i think of providing proper uh, neuro rehab for people so again, not going to ask you too many questions of this stuff. This gets really in detail. I nerded out a little bit, um, but uh, here's a hemianopsia. So for this gentleman, <clears throat> he can see the left side of his world, but the right side of his world is blurred out. And I'm sure you guys have seen this in stroke patients. But what we're doing is we're doing a lot of light sound stimulation, a lot of vestibular uh, therapy to try and integrate some some of those neighboring pools to see if we can get vision to change, which which we're really hoping for. 
Um, and this is the opposite. So a left homonymous hemianopsia, you're going to have changes on the um, right half of the visual pathway. So it's usually a right PCA stroke. So if you want to learn any more about that, you don't have to for our class, but I love this stuff. And there is a website. They had some great videos on there, just some great knowledge. So here's where I just zoomed in for everything. So for the impairment areas, if you see an impairment in parietal lobe, you can, you can check out some, some of that stuff there. Just pause the video and, and read it a little bit closer. And occipital lobe, cerebellum, the brain stem, the temporal lobe, and the frontal lobe. So just real quick to cover vascular supply to the cerebellum, you've got your superior cerebellar artery, the pica, and the aica. So posterior inferior cerebellar artery and the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. So just this is good to know, <clears throat> just for if you're ever working with stroke patients. The SCA, superior cerebellar artery, branches off the basilar. The anterior inferior artery also branches off the basilar, and then your pica branches off the vertebral arteries, and you can see that here. So here's your basilar artery, superior cerebellar, going to the anterior lobe of the cerebellum, so that's legs. The uh, aica off the basilar artery to posterior lobe, cerebellum, a little bit of anterior and posterior. And then you've got your um, your pica here, so going down to the vertebral arteries. So important stuff. So here's a cool uh, case study of stroke rehab. Here's a 73-year-old male. He presented to our clinic um, for right-sided weakness. So he suffered a stroke on the, on the left MCA, so the left middle cerebral artery. He's had difficulty using his right arm and performing fine motor movements, and he also has benefited from physical therapy, but he wanted to see what we could do for him. Uh, he's a business owner here in Atlanta. He traveled in from New York and um, came in for a few days because he just wasn't getting the progress that he wanted. And I really like this image. If you just Google these images, you'll have them here. But <clears throat> um, just like the guy I have in this week that I just talked about, you know, recognizing letters in groups, perceiving letters and shapes. So he's got a lot of issues with the DBPQ, uh, flips them around, and, and, and that causes a lot of issues with his reading. Um, but yep, a left MCA stroke would be would be right around here. So that's this patient here. He had a lot of issues with motor control on the right side, especially of his uh, right hand. So he'd like to write and he'd like to walk better. Um, he'd like to be able to ride his horse again. He's he was an avid polo player, and then he's he's very embarrassed because he owns a couple of big businesses and. He has an, a little bit of an altered gait and altered movement, um, and he thinks that his physical uh, presence uh, that is perceived as you know a cognitive issue, and his cognition is great. It's just he's got some physical issues. <clears throat> so he had some increased flexor tone on the right side with some weakness. So you'll see the increased tone, um, and you'll see weakness with the stroke, depending on the chronicity of the stroke. He had a circumductive gait and a decreased right arm swing, so he just wasn't moving the right side of his body that good, and he didn't have coordinated movement of his legs, so you'll see what's called a circumductive gait where they kind of make a little half circle to get the leg out in front. He had decreased extension at the shoulder and elbow, and then a lot of fatigue when, we was, when he was doing any exercise to the right side. So for you guys in the clinic, uh, mirror therapy for stroke patients is one of my most favorite things to do. I love to trick the brain. So what we would do is we'd have him put his right arm, his affected arm behind the mirror and then look at his left arm in the mirror. So if you look at this picture here, his left arm is right here. <clears throat> and this isn't him, this is an image off of Google, but here's the left arm and then here's what looks like to the brain, his right arm, right? But he wouldn't be looking at this arm here, he'd only be looking here and we'd have him do exercises and his brain would think, hey, what the heck, my arm actually moves good and it would actually start to move better. And we would do that while we're providing different types of stimulation. So vibration, electrical stimulation, all to the right side of his body. Um, we did some right cerebellar act exercises to activate this area of the body and the left area of the brain. Gait protocol therapy to change his circumductive gait, which I'll talk about in the future. And then vagal nerve exercises. So he was only able to come in for a few days, but um, it, it was pretty neat. He got home and then he... Uh, 
he shot me an email and he said um, he had improvement in his balance and gait, he had better range of motion, decreased flexor tone, and then he was able to <clears throat> withstand longer periods of rehab. He wouldn't fatigue as fast. So he sent me this email and he said, hey, another first. I took a shower the same and was able to wash the top of my head with my right hand for the first time in two years. Thanks. Just some simple stuff that we did. And, um, you know, just, just a reminder, this stuff – I love neuro. I love neurophysiology. Uh, I think to apply neurophysiology to the clinical side, we have to get functional with our exercises, and I think that's what we do with with some of this stuff. So um, that's pretty much it for this lecture. I'll, I'll mostly ask a lot of anatomy questions. Um, after this first test, we're really going to get into some pain pathways and rehabilitation of pain. So hope you guys enjoy it. If you have any questions, uh, please let me know.